and the saturate to propose further hypotheses together with the legitimizing procedures of showing what the consequences of what you said are give rise to a very rich uh, flux of activity. Let's see if this contains any entity which the other doesn't and which is without meaning. No, I think all of those are meaningful terms within the context of TDS, the decision system. Um, repair, oh, oh crack, is got, crack is a global uh, damage to the environment. It requires at least the cooperation of a couple of ships to do anything about it, and it blocks an entire trading route between bases. It's not just a hole which is an impediment in one place or a lot of them which might be a larger impediment, it is crack which changes the topology by cutting communication between two bases unless something's done about it. Singularity of that kind. Um, it's one of the things that makes TDS very real. I suggest we break now, is that right? Um, you seem to be signaling me as to it. I suggest you go now immediately in the remaining 15 minutes or so into the comparison to AI techniques uh, as we discussed. Mm -hmm. I, I think that would be the best thing, and then we can conclude on that. Yeah, I think we'll turn that off, because there's no point in... Well, they, there are various ways of approaching this, and I am... I guess what I've said already will be for another theory of sense implication. Uh, this allows or always admits the local formulation of implication and truth valuation. Very few of the Now I'm speaking chiefly here about folk in the US. Now I could speak about European AI as well. There's a lot to cover. Can you remember the name of the character of Steel, is it? Shank. Shank, Shank, Robert Shank. Um, is probably aware of this, but Yes, that's no. uh, In fact, it doesn't make it very plain that each expert occupies a different world. Um, being the expert on, if we take a steely brown kind of field, uh, repairing power supplies. Uh, the expert on capacitors and the expert on uh, resistors is actually in a different world, even though those worlds happen to obey very similar sorts of logic and so on. Uh, and it would be a great mistake to suppose that the capacitor was a resistor. Now, although they can be subsumed by the term impedance, together with inductance. Um, so another feature where there is a difference, the marked difference between expert systems is one which I think is an omission perhaps on the part of the expert system guys, 
And us guys, who are also very much concerned with expert systems, if you put the interpretation of the mesh to a couple of thought sticker up, say, to TDS, that is an expert system operating on a command control environment. Uh, but you can operate on any environment, it doesn't matter. Um, providing and that it has uh, appropriate strategies, tactics in the command control environment, descriptions, etc., built in by people who are using that environment. Um, another big difference is the difference we've already mentioned, but it is worthy of repetition between what is meant by knowledge? I mean, expert systems are working on the basis of knowledge. So is most AI knowledge representation. Whereas, in fact, the majority of the knowledge representation, whether called expert or like expert systems or not, uh, is in fact very much more like a database. And presupposes how people think and more or less ordains it. Now, I'm in no way denigrating this, excepting it comes to copper very often when it goes from talking about descriptions to talking about processes. I give an example of this, COD's relational operators, where we have a number of relations, say, between pay and employee name, and uh, between uh, maybe bonus, uh, shop, and employ in shop by name or number, and a variety of other such relations uh, between variants of one kind or another, which usually are not numerical variants uh, and are sort of rank order variants only. Um, the relations between these relations are called relational operators, such as a join, um, which is literally the joining together on specified coordinates of more than one relation, on specified variable more than one relation. And um, another one would be union, another one would be quotient, another one would be intersection, so on, and various other relations which are now quite rich. And uh, the tendency here is, of course, if you start a search with one or more keys and uh, arrive up and give usually specify a target class. Uh, this is fine if you're dealing with descriptions and relational descriptions, and they're fine. If you're dealing with processes, you're in a mess. Where exactly do processes fit in? Well, very awkwardly, you have to be sort of tagged on to the end of pointers somewhere. And uh, in fact, it is prescribed, in a way, by the class of relational operators what can be done, inferred, in that system. However much you may join some fancy method, syntactically fancy method, for putting the type of statement which is common in library access systems of so-and-so, or so-and-so, etc., and not what have you, uh, as well into the input statements. Um, so this, in fact, is capable of dealing with, uh, indeed, process, does deal with process, though the process, upon execution, will produce either a behavior or a description, whatever you like to call it. Uh, in a way of saying this, I suppose, is that you have constrained, although it's still very liberal what you can do, in the way of operations on relational databases, uh, you have constrained the way in which the thing can do its own thinking, <laughs> inverted commas, close inverted commas, uh, to applying these operators in some clever manner. And it uh, is perfectly all right if you're dealing with descriptions, but it's not perfectly all right to get processes because they clash in the most unpleasant manner very often. And if they don't, you have to put arbitrary exclusions in, which there's another difference, uh, not so much in the form as in the philosophy. Um, apart from, I mean, Brackman, I think, is, is a, an ideal U.S. example of this. Um, the um, He's a guy very, very sensitive 
to um, epistemology and philosophy. Yet he's also very much concerned with computational efficiency. This guy uh, adopts what I think is a pretty standard and I think a very damaging trick. Um, I don't use the word trick pejoratively at all. I use it as a, a gambit, a, an expedient, a methodology, or something, a pompous word for it. But it's, it's a sort of bag of tricks in that sense of the word of taking a system which has chords and ancestors and really heaven knows what and making, adding on bits so that adding on bits that are not actually in any way pre-specified by the rules of a language such as a thing must be unfoldable in any universe under any head topic okay? um, and inference rules like expand and condense and so on is kind of, or construction rules like right, saturate. A bit is added on, another piece is added on to accommodate what he finds, and he is a very sensitive person, to be deficiencies in the system. Now it's added on in a sort of computer science sense rather than added on in a logical sense. The logic is not extended. It's really the the sort of model, if you like, is extended by adding on further things. So it's perfectly true that I find it very difficult to think of anything I couldn't possibly express in that system. But by Lord, it would take an awful lot of operations to do it, and it's a it's an enormously complex thing. Uh, and in contrast to this. Um, the state or the philosophy uh, of development of thought sticker type implementations, thought sticker implementations of L sub P is based upon the extension of L sub P. I mean, what has happened in the past is that we might have taken uh, the circumstance such as this one. and said, well, look, that is disallowed, one trick. Now, we already had a notation for and a means of spelling out the similarity and the difference of analogical relations of which these things are progenitors. We might have just said, well, that's meaningless. It's a disallowed expression. That would be very easy. You don't draw that kind of thing. You can't write it down. Um, it would be very easy to sort of add on an ad hoc trick for finagling it in some way at the front end or, or whatever, or the back end of the system. Instead, of very fact, it turned out that you could construct what was currently called analogy out of this thing by putting in a distinction of universes necessary. Now, that is not that is not. That is not. Um, oh, well, I'm sorry. In fact, what we did is to go through a piece of research which discovered that indeed what was meant by an analogy was something derivable from this event. Now this event is one which is automatic, it's not just, it is mandatory, if indeed you insist on that. So if you insist on that, and you don't like these other solutions, you get that. And that is an alteration in L sub P, a development of L sub P, because, in fact, as my users wrote this, I wanted to write it and meant it. What they really meant, of course, was that. Uh, same comment applies to this, which arose from analysis of the very simple construction. A-T-P-Q. 
Uh, yeah. We just have disallowed that. We don't put a boundary inside a boundary. We did have a notion of generalization, a rather ad hoc one. It now became possible to say this is the basis of a generalization. And if a user wishes to say that, that is what the user means. Uh, well, he might call it an abstraction or something, but it is the word generalization is just a word. Hamilton and I couldn't care less about the particular word used, but it is that construction which constructs another order of mesh. And the one I've drawn here actually constructs a, a, a rather larger, more interesting other order of mesh. So that is interpretable, but it is in fact a generalization which the user is talking about, and it requires me at least to put a label on that and to shove it up outside the top okay? and it then stands a thing like a model which used to be remember we used to have a model you could have t alone if it had a model of t or you could have this alone alpha and um, in omega 1 which isn't really omega 1 it's just alpha omega naught uh, yeah. The alpha points to now, as a matter of fact, that analysis was very fruitful because it led to the notion of well, there's an enormous similarity between the case of that and a certain type of analogy uh, that indeed a generalization has a class of exemplars as its interpretation and the element generalized have exemplars or values if you like. Can we do anything different with LP than you could, could you do everything that you want to do in LP with the concept of frames? It's very difficult to say because the concept of frame is originally conceived is so very broad that it's rather like, in a sense, saying, um, you know, can I do anything with a particle, <laughs> a class of particles in the universe or something? Um, I think frame-like implementations of LP are very valid. Um, but the, the, the specialized versions of frames no, you couldn't. I mean, you have uh, LP goes much further than that. Uh, but the, the notion of frame as it was originally conceived, merely a thing with an instance of and a connective relation and a body, is, um, and maybe other bodies attached to the body, is just, um, is such a general thing that I guess you can do anything with it. It's, it's more, a, it's, it's, it's rather like, a, in a sense, asking about logic in terms of an expedient of computer science or a language in terms of the experience about computer science. Uh, there are implementations of, of L sub P which use frames liberally. Um, and Paul will be better in a position to answer this. Uh, as to the, I mean, it's a question which, as far as I can see, could only be answered in terms of expediency of implementation. And um, I I'm not personally a, a, a recent computer scientist. I, I have done computers many years ago, but I, uh, yeah. Just from the point of view of what frames don't do in their generality that LP does do. So for example, what does the semantic net not do, which the sound mesh does do? Well, this is the sort of thing I was addressing. I mean, semantic nets are essentially uh, Indices. Somebody yesterday used, uh, I think it was Jeffrey, used this delightful idea that semantic net is, is, is really a yellow pages and telephone directory. And uh, there's a certain sense in which it says nothing about actuality. And that if I remove a telephone number from it, generally speaking, very little happens. Uh, the, um, in fact, of course, in reality, the guy who moved away are gone to his grave. 
or the lady's gone some other part, and it's nice to go see her in Florida. Uh, and uh, used to be your neighbor. And it's great. The, uh, but I mean, the point is that the, the, the semantic net per se isn't semantic. I don't know why, why anybody ever called them semantic nets. They are sort of associated melanges. Some of them are frame organized, they're not melanges. And uh, else P is quite different. It would make a great deal of difference if you tried to delete, but well, you can't strictly delete. Can you tell then, us how it would make a difference? Well, it would probably, yeah, if you put some bit away, it would probably modify the entire structure. So it would reverberate yeah. throughout it the mesh. It would reverberate throughout the whole mesh. You get the thing falling apart or coming together. And you, the consequence, I don't know, except we take a particular example, but certainly a deletion of things or even removal to an independent universe of things will affect generally, not always, generally, the whole structure. It will go right through the whole thing. I mean, if I have a, a hole in the environment, if I put a hole into the environment, be practical about it, it, it changes not only the environment, or a crack in the environment, it changes not only the environment, but also very often the representation. In other words, certain kinds of hypotheses become untenable. And uh, it, it, is, it is not only in the actuality that, the, that this occurs, it's also in the representation of the actuality. Because if I remove the thing representing crack, or say that a crack has occurred, or something like that, it's going to pass right through the system, generally. Um, and that, I guess, is a significant difference. And perhaps the main significant difference, apart from this knowledge and belief business, which I I think it's equally significant that the property arises because you are representing what is coherent and distinct and a process rather than what is T and F according to some canonical scheme of inference and implication. And the canonical scheme will, may, can, or several may, can, exist locally in that structure. But, uh, in other words, it doesn't deny them at all, uh, or prohibit them at all, and if you want to, you can talk entirely in terms, you build the rules in, in terms of these canonical schemes. But, in fact, it's a much broader thing. And because it's broader, in fact, because of that property of being able to represent on a par belief and true belief or knowledge, uh, and because, in fact, you preserve uh, past hypotheses and so on, and only conditionally make them independent, uh, the, this, this, I think this property arises chiefly because of that. I'm prepared to argue the point um, and debate the point, rather. It's, um, one might think of other key properties which are more important, but. Um, I think those are those and closely related, those are these, and closely related is, I believe, um, a, a proper interpretation of analogy. And this has puzzled nearly everybody, excepting the only people who really tackled it, as far as I know, are the guys at Georgia Tech and KRL, uh, as uh, Winograd and Florid, who do take analogy seriously, uh, so they are in K to some extent. Um, um, who do take analogy seriously, but I don't think succeed quite in tackling it. And I, um, as a matter of fact, things that apply to analogy also apply to the treatment of generalization, I believe. Um, next, the, uh, the difference in that few, if any, and here perhaps KRL and its uh, uh, derivatives are, are have something in common. Um, Elsa P and Tellman meshes, thought stick, whatever you like to call the area, has constructive rules, which may the, the consequences which are revealed and may be denied by the user, either temporarily or permanently, but. Uh, they're always applied. 
these rules are saturation, various unfoldment operations, mandatory uh, condensation, and so forth. Um, you can always take the mesh in this way, and uh, it is an uh, active thing. Um, in other words, mostly when people talk about languages, let alone semantic nets, which uh, presumably are use uh, some sort of language for expression, like they, they all do, uh, explicitly or not. Uh, well, speaking of a static thing, which remains, uh, as it were, uh, it's, it's a passive kind of writing surface. Now, there is an aspect of a mesh, namely these verbal pictures, which may be so regarded. Things like that are, if you like, a passive representation of active things. They can always be converted into the active thing by operations of which these are primitive exemplars. And often those are very surprising. So the class of those unfoldments is the dual, literally, strictly, of the class of entailment meshes. And this is a unique property which arises due to the definition of concept and the definition of agreement and coherence. Um, the, um, oh, amongst the constructive principles, of course, is mandatory bifurcation or the rule of Geneva, since it was invented by Vittorio Medora of the National Council for Research in Geneva. Um, so, Elsa P has uh, dynamics. Finally, it, it represents analogy, the generalization adequately, I think, hygienically, without having to fudge in some way what's going on. It's perfectly natural to do it. And it's natural in the logic to do it. It may be difficult in the implementation, incidentally. It, it, it is possible. It may be difficult in the implementation, but it's, to my mind, healthier to do it that way. And the philosophy of it differs from most, namely that it seems to me that most of AI starts out with something that's fairly easy machine-wise and quite elegant machine-wise. Like, for example, language such as Lisp, which is fine. Okay, I mean, it's lovely, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful programming language. It's, it's not a, a natural language. In any sense, it's not a language in the sense of things that you can agree in. But to, as a programming language, it's, it's not a natural language. A programming language is beautiful. And you take out sort of convenient things to do with this primitives or something. Now, um, of course, you use a language like this. I believe this is one you probably are going to use. I, I'm tending to use mostly. And there have been other past previous more, more elementary lisp interpretations uh, uh, sorry not interpretations uh, implementations of uh, um, so I start from as representative of this group start from the point of view that an expert can darn well at some stage say anything. I'm not going to deny. I'm not going to pretend I know how people think, like we seem to do in a certain sense by providing relational operators, say, in a relational data structure. I'm not going to dogmatize about that. I don't know how they think at all. I think everybody thinks differently. They all learn differently. And different, the same person learns differently on different occasions, thinks different thoughts on different occasions. Who in the world am I to dogmatize about that? I'm not. I'm not going to. I may not be able to accommodate them just now, but I've given a couple of instances where we've modified due to statements that have occurred and have been adhered to the entire structure of the language in order to, therefore, the entire structure of representation, too, uh, which may either be regarded as an action representation, procedural action representation, or as a, an image like representation, as bubble diagram. Um, and the whole thing's been modified rather than just the other thing. So there's a different bias here. There's a different bias instead of saying, let's see what this can do. That's a very temporary aim. In general, 
the philosophy is let it do let the author or the expert do or say what they wish if they insist upon it I only present the consequences as they are at them they insist upon saying what they wish they don't have got to modify the language so it can be said and this is an extremely pragmatic approach because I can see no reason at all even though I can make theories of learning like conversation theory and even though that is interpret uh, is an interpretation or interpretable as uh, L sub P that doesn't dogmatize upon how we think it only says that thinking is such and learning is such that uh, concepts which are bundles of processes open to execution are uh, capable of being produced and reproduced both produced and reproduced uh, by a thing called type concept Sure. Good question, Gordon. I, maybe, and I apologize for being late. Mm. I may have missed part of this in the beginning. But mm. in entailment, uh, I should say, the sort of uh, approach you're taking, you're taking essentially on some conceptual base from whomever, uh, person A, and you're conveying that as best you can to person B, and you're trying to hit the criteria that you were talking about, essentially conveying of information or knowledge you want to extend this. Uh, you can do it by a number of ways now. So it's really, it's a conversation in the broader sense yes. between two individuals to develop, uh, convey uh, conceptually one thing from A to B, and hopefully by the retest of B to A, you get some feeling in terms of how the two converge. In some of the other areas of AI, uh, you mentioned Winograd, for example. There's the other aspect, which is trying to take whatever is before us out there in reality, uh, using the thing, how does one see or perceive a cube or, uh, or a circle, and trying to develop essentially the concept, if you will, tabula rasa, what's out here to bring information out from the external world. In the case that you described, it's been person A and person B. How about person A alone, and the kind of conceptual map that person builds in the sense of what is basically the world out there? Will, will uh, your LP uh, theory handle that? Yes, and uh, the reason for this, Jim, is that uh, A and B for example, is up there, a sketch very briefly today because we've been doing A's and B's. Well, we go defined, in fact, as participants in a conversation, and it is literally a conversation. And in that conversation, what would be inscribed in L sub P as a topic are the public concepts, the shared concepts between A and B, uh, together with their relation one to another. Uh, one representation is, it's got dual representations. One is in terms of a mesh, and the other in terms of the unfolding. Now, we go on to say that A and B may, of course, also be groups of people, etc., team, for example, um, and um, maybe a conversation between teams, even, people in teams, certainly. And there may also be very another common kind of conversation which frequently isn't observed too well, but always happens. And uh, various uh, metaphors have been used to designate this uh, type of conversation, which is usually internal to the brain. I'm not speaking here of uh, subvocal speech necessarily because I mean the languages of brains are uh, imagery and all sorts of things and they're, they're strange and they're not limited to you know, yeah like yeah it would be like a and a prime if you like they're both in your head but you've got a mouth calls it uh, in the AI paradigm he calls it was it call it a uh, critic and, and a proposer and critic uh, in many instances, it might be better to think about uh, as planner and critic, or commander and uh, counter-commander, or something of this kind. Uh, the same person imagines each role, uh, and maybe acts in one role for real. 
their commander and is imagining, perfectly really imagining, has a model of, an image of, an independent piece of his brain, apart from a dialogue with it, compare and compra contrasting, hence the analogical part, the analogical reason, reasoning of the opposing commanders. And a little conversation goes on between them. Now, generally, that is unobserved, because it goes on inside the head. Uh, what we have been chatting about, chiefly in the other seminars, is the ways in which that conversation, which between what I still call participants, even though they happen to be in the same head, the commander, imagining himself as commander, as well as being one, the counter-commander, imagined by, but still active in the brain of the commander, A and B, so A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, J, K, I don't mind how many, L. Uh, the, um, maybe L Master thing, can, can be exteriorized through various sorts of interface. And one obvious one is, is peer criticism and discussion. Um, I mean, it, this is used very commonly for doing just this thing. Uh, another is, of course, sort of interview technique. Uh, another is things like CAST, which we were talking about, uh, called Assembly System Tutorial Environment, you see. Uh, another one is thing like intuition, that portable thing. Another one are, you know, all sorts of devices of this kind capable of representing both uh, knowledge in the broad sense of, of knowledge and belief, as it were, uh, and also action, uh, so that explanations are given. And um, this is a way of exteriorizing or externalizing normally private debate. So my reply would be that an author is invariably acting in this mode privately. Uh, the interface is so facile and makes so many genuine questions. Um, he just prints out stupid inquiries, but um, makes uh, queries necessary to complete a statement which the guy has insisted upon. Uh, that a lot of that otherwise internal and hidden conversation is brought out as a behavior which can be looked at and consists in the construction of a mesh. Now, this does not, of course, prevent meshes being made by a team of people, or even meshes made by different people being compared and contrasted. And there's a couple of examples there of a couple of TDS commanders, both of whom uh, have very different images of what well was like, uh, what was salient, all the rest of it, and how it was connected. They're both perfectly coherent. They're entirely different. They're undergoing run, runs of the system, as far as I recall, is under the same condition. Um, I forget whether they're in a team or not. I believe they. Are. I believe those two are team members. I'm not quite sure. So they're both members of a team, but they're only able to communicate by means of a monitored channel. They can't speak directly to one another, and. Um, so they have separate meshes representing that. Gordon, I have a separate question. I'd be interested in your observation. About three or four years ago, maybe more now, I was reading an article by Chapman Miller. I've forgotten exactly the title. It was, it was at Harvard. And he kind of bimodally distributed the AI arena in the sense of saying there is one group uh, of AI researchers who feel that the answers to making machines intelligent, books, essentially, is by trying to derive the appropriate model of human behavior and build that model into a machine. The other approach, he says, is to simply figure out what it is that you want that organism, the machine, or the person to do, and to look at the structure of the machine in such a way that it's optimal and its solution to take machine uh, push toward uh, toward advancing the state of the art. And he even opted toward the machine solution approach. Uh, he did. The observation on that. Which, yeah. which of the two would you subscribe to that? I, I would subscribe very much to the psychological. 
Um, I mean, I think it's very interesting to make machines do things efficiently if you know what you want them to do. I don't pretend to do that. I don't pretend to know what people do. And um, I, I don't think you can pretend to know what people, I mean, how they think. I mean, you know, you know what they do, obviously. But uh, I think it, it, is, it is an impossible to say how people think because people are so darn varied. I think you can say a lot of things about their style and the strategies they adopt. And uh, there are lots of things which are dependent on context because they work differently in different contexts. But these are by no means a dogma about how you think. Or they don't get into that. And I, I think that if it was possible to you know, sort of take the best machine implementation for how somebody thinks, or the best machine configuration to do the kind of thing we do, regardless of people, we'd be doomed to uh, failure and disaster. Uh, so uh, I dare certainly don't go for the machine optimal one, um, because I think this would be fine if we had a missile or something and we wanted to guide it, or an auto pallet and we wanted to put an auto pallet in. Then we could reduce the, you know, machine weight and size and fit the vehicle with it neatly. That's great. But in the case of systems that are called intellectual, uh, we can, in the first place, aim to look at how people work. But I believe that aim, I'm a little bitter that I'm triangulated out of that polar thing. And I'd say that really we can't know how people work at all. But we can build up a proto-language, which is crude but manipulable, which remains machine implementable, and doesn't have the arrogance to say, I know how people work, or could know how people work in private detail. It allows them to work as they wish to work. And it indeed, indeed tells an awful lot about people. It, it is maybe regarded as a discovery tool, about people in the sense that he takes their output. And um, is that a fair reply? Right. Oh. Could I make one point? Is it possible, please, Chairman? Right, I just make one. I'd like to get one more point on record that I seemed a bit uh, prissy, if you like, um, in starting out this talk with this assertion that I was really only going to talk about truth, value, and order, and process rules. Now, there is growing up in AI not only an expert system movement and paradigm, but a paradigm beyond expert systems, which literally thinks about populations of machines, and sees intelligence or intellect. Uh, and I wouldn't call it artificial now. Because I don't think intellect a machine which satisfies the usual algebraic constraints of computing engines, Turing machines. A population of machines which interact not because they're synchronized together and therefore operate in parallel, like many machines do, and then have, when they're finished, you would interrupt them, use them again, use that bit again. A serial process, uh, but operate concurrently by transferring information from one to another in order that they should interact. In other words, they have a need and they transfer information to another machine as a need. Bears a fair resemblance to the kind of fabric which, like brains perhaps, is capable of intellect, although it may be a different sort of intellect, the intellect we know. Um, and Although I appreciate that one cannot simulate that in the architecture of current machinery, I think the next generation of machinery will become increasingly of that sort, which, as a matter of fact, is to say that it has a natural truth valuation scheme based upon distinction, coherence, and process, rather than having to force one out of the present truth valuation scheme. And this population paradigm I can see growing up with sufficient power and the expert systems we know as being harbingers of uh, technical development in architecture.
which when it comes will be very helpful to all of us. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing with us, Sue.